Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics. Our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than two dollars fifty per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Today on CityCast Philly, it's the Friday News Roundup. We're talking about the controversy over last week's police-involved shooting in Fairhill, and a second officer shot within seven days. Plus. Could Governor Josh Shapiro's budget proposal save a beloved regional rail line? It's Friday, February 2nd. I'm Trina Nuri, and here's what Philly's talking about. Max Marion, reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Welcome back to the show. Trina, good to be back. Good to have you. And Corey Sharber, general assignment reporter at WHYY News. Hey, Corey. Hey, thanks for having me. Let's start with an icebreaker. This week, the Franklin Institute, which is down in Logan Square, celebrated something huge back in 1954, which would mean 70 years ago. The iconic giant heart opened to the public. The giant heart, for those who don't know, is a replica of a human heart. And you can walk through... It's two stories, and you can hear sounds of an actual human heart beating. So I've got to ask y'all, have you ever walked through the giant heart? I haven't uh, I haven't walked through that yet. I moved to Philly like uh, in July of 2022, and um, I, I need to start doing more Philly things in my free time. I feel you, Corey. But if you need some ideas of things to do, check out yesterday's episode. It's our February things to do episode. So you get tons of ideas, but add this one to your list too. Max, have you been through the giant heart? Yeah, there was an incredible tweet or post going around on social media the other day about like, if you grew up within 50 miles of the Philly region, you've definitely walked through the heart. (laughs) And like I have vivid memories of being in the aortic valve of the Ben Franklin Institute when I was like a kid. And I was like, whoa. And uh, (laughs) then I just stopped thinking about what happens inside our bodies since then. So, you know. Me too. It's a classic field trip, either if for a school field trip or a summer camp, you got to go through the heart. I do think for some younger Philadelphians and visitors, it may be kind of intimidating, I think. So just encourage the little ones that it's okay to walk through this heart. I feel like I feel like even as an adult, I would be really freaked out by like (laughs) what I would be experiencing walking through a two story heart, you know, (laughs) just in the middle of of Philadelphia. (laughs) Just just step step into the heart, children. (laughs) All right, let's get into some of the top stories of this week. Max, you've been following a shooting involving a police officer that actually happened last Friday. During that incident, an officer was shot and wounded, and police also shot and killed a man. The incident has been controversial because there's footage being shared on social media of what happened inside this corner store in Fairhill. What did the initial viral video on social media show us? It was a 30 second clip that picked up clearly after the police stop had taken place in this narrow corner store deli that sells beer and has a couple gambling machines in Fairhill where some guys were hanging out. Um, the video picks up with these two officers kneeling on top of the, of this 28 year old man, Alexander Spencer. Uh, you can only see their guns and then you hear some gunshots go off. The video is moving very quickly. The person filming runs out of the store, then comes back in after the two gunshots and starts filming again. And at that point, the officers are sort of radioing and calling for backup. So the questions that it raised are, you know, did Mr. Spencer have a gun? Did he fire that gun at police um, first and before they they shot and killed him? And where is that gun now? A lot of questions raised by 30 seconds of footage that, you know, naturally didn't show the full series of events. Mm -hmm. Max, can you tell us who the two officers were? Um, The two officers were partners in the 24th District, which is one of the city's most troubled and violent, covers Kensington, a lot of the heaviest drug markets, a lot of active shootings. The department has not released the name or publicly confirmed the name of the officer who was shot, um, but his partner who who fired the fatal shot at Alexander Spencer, his name was Raheem Hall. He had been with the department for six years, I believe, and both officers are currently on administrative leave as a result of the investigation. What stood out to me in this story is that you reported that 
Commissioner Kevin Bethel said that the 30 second video was misleading. And so on Tuesday, police released a five minute video and they say that they were given permission from Spencer's family. Yes, that is correct. And it it was very unusual for the department to so early in an investigation release full footage showing, you know, as closely as, as, as we can, the full interaction that led up to the police shooting and the officer being shot. But, you know, the, the way that the department had, had went about it by releasing so few details, by a, a couple details shifting over the course of, uh, of the next 48 hours, and this viral video really pushing it over the edge. It put them in a spot where, they, the, you know, the only way that they could exonerate their narrative was to release the full video. We're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, more top stories of the week. This is CityCast Philly. Shipping can make or break a sale, so optimize how you ship your orders with ShipStation. They make it easy to automate and manage orders no matter how big your business grows. And they might even be able to help reduce shipping and warehouse costs. So optimize and keep up your momentum for growth with ShipStation. Sign up for your free 60-day trial now at ShipStation.com and use the code P-O-D. That's ShipStation.com with the code P-O-D. There's a big difference between talking and reporting, especially right now with a fire hose worth of news coming your way. You know what helps? Having reporters in the field. I'm Brad Milkey from ABC News, and that's what we've got on ABC's daily podcast, Start Here. Every morning, Start Here takes you across the country and around the world for a quick, smart look at the stories that matter. It's fast, it's straightforward, and sometimes, gasp, news can even be fun. So let's meet up tomorrow morning. Listen to Start Here wherever you get your podcasts. Max, so what has Commissioner Kevin Bethel said about this particular incident? Well, Bethel's initial comments on Friday were part of what stirred a little bit of controversy or added to the controversy once the viral video came out. Bethel had initially said that the uh, suspect fired two shots at police officers and that was later sort of changed to one shot. There was some confusion about the number of wounds on the police officer victim. And Mayor Sherelle Parker and her commissioner choice, Kevin Bethel, have been you know, very adamant about throwing all their support behind the police officers. They came out 100 percent and said, you know, we stand by what happened here and that the officers were clearly, you know, the victims in this situation. And there was not, you know, they on Friday night, the message was clear that there was no wrongdoing here. But, you know, from the community side, there's been a lot of skepticism based off of past narratives that police have walked back recently with regards to police shootings. Right. And we recently saw it with the incident involving Eddie Irizarry. And we talked about that on the show. Max, there also was another police officer shot Wednesday morning. And this was, according to the Inquirer, this all happened in the Yorktown section of North Philadelphia. It seems officers were serving a narcotics warrant when shots were fired. Max, can you give us some context here? How often is it that Philadelphia police officers are involved in shootings, whether they're injured or unfortunately killed? Yeah, I mean, we've definitely seen an uptick of it in the most recent years. Uh, last year, there were eight officers shot, which is, you know, for, for comparison in 2020, which was, you know, an exceedingly violent year in general for the city, just with the number of shootings, there was only four officers shot. Last year, went up to eight. Having two in a week um, in the first month of the year is is not a good sign. It certainly raises a lot of awareness and, and shows that this, you know, the gun violence in the city is is still extremely chaotic and and rampant. And these these situations are, are extremely complex. I think that's the best way to put it. To read more on these stories, check out the reporting from the Philadelphia Inquirer by clicking the links in our show notes. Now, this next story is about how service on a beloved SEPTA regional rail line is being threatened to get cut and why Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro is stepping in now. Corey, for folks who haven't taken a ride on the Chestnut Hill West Regional Rail Line, can you tell us where this line takes riders? The Chestnut Hill West Line uh, obviously takes people from Chestnut Hill all the way to Center City. And of course, with people who have probably lived in Philly a long time, you're probably well aware of how there's certain areas of Philadelphia that are much easier to access than others. And of course, if this line was to go down, despite it being, uh, you know, one of SEPTA's least ridden lines uh, or least road, you know, depending on uh, the proper use of English there. I'm from the South, y'all. We do things a little different. <laughs> but if this line is to go down, um, there's not just the concerns of this line going down, making it harder for those folks to get, you know, to Center City and beyond, but also folks getting back, but also how this will affect other, you know, SEPTA, SEPTA routes within the, that area as well. 
So, Corey, let's take a step back. You've spoken to riders and community supporters who rallied for saving this train on Sunday. What have they told you about what this regional rail line means to them? Well, it's it's you know, I think it's it's pretty safe to say that with the, this line isn't just, you know, just some train line that just so happens to go through uh, Shasta Hill and Mount Airy and Germantown. This is something that connects all those neighborhoods together to the rest of the city. I mean, this is something that um, when I was at the uh, rally um, on Sunday, it was interesting how the rally basically took place at like a neighborhood coffee shop that happens to be attached to the line. And it's not just looking at something that you know, it's just like, oh, yeah, it's this easy thing. I commute to work uh, a couple days a week, you know, thanks to the wonderful hybrid work schedules that most of us have now. It's some, it's a place where people gather nor- regularly in this neighborhood. Uh, it was something that is viewed as an anchor. And, you know, it's not something that if, if this thing is to go down, I mean, there's concern of, well, not only is it going to be tougher to get to work or get to other places, what's going to happen to... The rest of the neighborhood when that thing, if that thing it gets cut off. Right. And so like the area businesses and things like that. Like, right. We're looking at something that people are worried that any investors who are looking to do developments or active developments going on, it's like, well, if SEPTA just so happens to completely collapse, then are all these investors going to pull out? Right. Because it, it, it would be an amenity added to living in these neighborhoods. It's also just the we're still looking at, well, is the money coming in or not? Uh, Right now, everyone's just super stressed out and up in arms because right now, only time will tell, like, if the money will come in and if everything will get fixed. Right. So. Yeah. So, Corey, when you're talking about the money, what you're really talking about is the growing concerns that service could get cut in some communities with low ridership like those along the Chestnut Hill West line. Because SEPTA doesn't have enough money in its budget, right? Correct. Yes. I mean, like uh, people have been raising concerns over SEPTA's budget um, for who knows how long now. I know that SEPTA, they put out this whole chart saying like, uh, hey, everyone, if we don't get funding to pass the uh, federal pandemic funding that's been really helping keep SEPTA afloat for some time. I mean, they're looking at as soon as July, if the funding doesn't come in, $240 million shortfall. I mean, that's, you know, it's not... I don't know if I don't know what two hundred forty million dollars looks like. Me either. I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't know if I wish I did because it seems like if you don't have two hundred forty million dollars, well, you're looking at you know a fifth of service getting cut. You're looking right. at you know fair hikes as well. I mean, it's looking like the, if the money doesn't come in, it's going to be really tough times ahead. Not just for you know SEPTA, obviously, but for people, including myself, who rely on transit to get around Philadelphia and the surrounding counties. For sure. So now Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro is stepping in. How did he offer help, Corey? Yes, Governor Shapiro, he's proposed a $282.2 million um, funding plan. You know, this isn't just for SEPTA. This is for transit services all across the state, which if this is to happen, it would be a one point, uh, I believe, like a nearly two percent increase in funds. And if this does get approved, it would be the first increase in the state share of public transit funding in over a decade. Um, It's believed that he will be addressing this during his um, budget address on February 6th. Um, This is something that could potentially define, you know, Shapiro's uh, term, you know, because, I mean, like anyone who becomes a governor, you obviously want to go, you know, eight years. And this is something that voters will probably be looking at as if he can get this done, they'll probably go back to the polls when he's up for re-election again. And this may be a deciding factor going forward. Interesting insight. All right. That was Corey Sharber, General Assignment Reporter for WHYY News and Max Mirren, Reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thank you both so much for breaking these stories down and for joining me on CityCast Philly. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jimmy. It's time for the tip of the week where we share a life hack for living in Philly. This one is for business owners. The city has a business security camera program which encourages businesses to buy and install cameras outside their properties. For some business owners, you can get city funding to cover up to $3,000 of the cost of the install. And for some stores, you can get 100% of the cost covered. We'll have a link in the show notes. If you have a tip of the week, we'd love to hear from you too. Call or text us at 215-259-8170. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. Our executive producer is Laura Benchoff. 
Our producer is Abby Fritz. Our Hey Philly newsletter editors are Asha Prahar and Adrian Gonzalez. And our host is me, Trine Nuri. Special thanks to Mary Lee Williams, Megan Harris, Sophia Lowe, and Francesca DeBecco. Music is by Philly's own Interminable, with additional music from All the Kimonos and James Weldon. If you enjoyed this week of episodes, please tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Philly. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Have a great weekend, y'all, and be safe. Bye.